is Tommy Prudhomme, and I'm the pastor at Salado United Methodist Church here in Salado, Texas. I am so happy that you have clicked on this link. I sincerely hope that you find this message meaningful and helpful in your spiritual journey. And I want you to know that no matter who you are and no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, we here at Salado United Methodist Church invite you to come as you are to join us for worship on Sunday mornings both at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And I would love to welcome you in person or you could attend virtually uh, via YouTube. May God bless you and yours. Today's scripture lesson comes from Mark verses 2 through 8 in the chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. So it was a long and winding road leading up to that <clears throat> mountaintop. It actually started at Jesus' baptism. I mean, it started way beyond that, but, but it started at Jesus' baptism. Uh, y'all remember a couple weeks ago we talked about that, Jesus standing in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, the Father's voice saying, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus has been identified, Jesus' identity, the beloved Son of God. But then he hardly even has a chance to enjoy that before the Holy Spirit whisks him out into the, into the wilderness where he spends 40 days and 40 nights fasting and praying and meditating in solitude and silence preparing for his ministry, but then Satan shows up and starts the attacks. And the attacks really didn't let up. Now, that's not to say that Jesus' ministry wasn't awesome and amazing. I mean, it was. I mean, all of the, the teaching, all of the preaching, all of the healing, all of the feeding, all of that stuff, all of those proofs of who Jesus was and of his power, but with every one of those experiences, with every one of those miracles, with every one of those, those identifications of who Jesus was as God's beloved Son, He would face rejection. He would face challenge. He'd face ridicule from the leaders of His very people, from the Jewish religious leadership. And then on top of that, his disciples, his closest friends and followers, they really didn't get who he was. They thought that he was maybe some kind of political leader come to liberate them from the Romans or some kind of military leader come to liberate them. And so one day he just flat out asked them. You know, it's, it's, it's about a week before the events that, that you just heard Terry read to you. It, it's a week earlier, and, and Jesus just says to him, who do you think that I am? Who am I? And, and Peter just sort of blurts out, well, you're the Messiah. You're the Savior. And, and Jesus might well have been thinking, finally, finally, after all this time, after being with these people for three years, finally, maybe they're starting to get it, starting to understand who I am. Or maybe not. Right, see, that, that moment, a week before the transfiguration, that moment when Jesus asks his disciples, who am I, was kind of a turning point in Mark's gospel. 
See, up until that point, even though things weren't perfect, they were pretty darn good, right? I mean, Jesus is going around. He's, he's living out his ministry. He's living out what it looks like to live in God's love. He's healing people. He's bringing healing and, and wholeness and, and food and and and. and and he's teaching people about what it looks like to live in God's kingdom, to live in God's love for themselves. And there's really not much talk about what's in his immediate future, what's fixing to happen to him. It's all just sort of the good stuff. But then as soon as Peter says, you're the Messiah, Jesus starts talking about rejection. He starts talking about suffering he starts talking about death his own death and those close to him he starts talking about going to jerusalem where everybody wants to kill him and so peter says stop it i mean basically says jesus shut up because he's not just telling this to his disciples he's saying this to everyone He's telling everybody that he's going to, and Peter's like, you want any followers? Like, no one's going to follow you if you're talking about it like that. And, and, and he says, you're not the one who's going to be rejected. You're the Messiah. You're, you're the rejector. You're not the one who's going to be suffering. You're the one who's going to be imposing suffering. You are going to conquer. That's what it means to be the Messiah. See, Peter, he understood who Jesus was, but he didn't understand what it meant. He didn't understand that, that for Jesus to be the Messiah, it meant that he, yes, he was the beloved Son of God. He was also the Lamb of God that had come to take away the sins of the world through his suffering and death. That's who he was. So Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Which if you were with us, Last week, you know, that takes us back to that time that Jesus spent out in the desert, right? When Satan, at the end of the 40 days, appeared to him and tempted him with exactly the same temptation, right? The temptation to power, the temptation to short-circuit the, the, the road that he was on, right? To say, instead, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can just, you can just get her done, Right? Just take care of it. Don't worry about God. Don't rely on God. Just do it. Just conquer. Just take over. Just impose your will. And that's basically what Peter was saying to him. Just do it. Just get her done. But Jesus resisted that temptation just like he resisted the temptation out in the desert from Satan. He resisted it. He stayed on the road that had been laid out for him. He stayed on that road to Jerusalem. He stayed on that road to rejection and suffering and death. But first we got this trip up the mountain. Right at the outset of that road to Jerusalem, we got this trip, this little hiking trip that he takes with some of his close friends, Peter, James, and John, up, up to the top of this mountain where he is transfigured. He is changed in front of them now there is so much good stuff in this one little passage of scripture there's so much symbolism there right there's there's moses and elijah there's the cloud there's the the tents you know that that peter wants to put up i mean we could camp out there for weeks y'all see what i did there camping out tents and i guess it doesn't work so well when you've got to explain it but uh, have to work on that a little bit. But anyway, yeah, we could stay there for a long, long time just studying all of the stuff in there. But I want to just focus on one thing, and that is what happens to Jesus? He is changed. He's changed. For, for just a little while there, his friends, Peter, James, and John, they get to see who he really is. Is. They get to see him in his power and glory. For just a few, a few minutes there, the, the veil is ripped aside and they can see him as he is. And then, and then God's voice comes, the Father's voice comes down and says, This is my beloved Son. 
just like at his baptism. This is my beloved son. But there's one difference. And I don't know whether you heard it or not. At, at his baptism, the father's voice says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Here, on top of the mountain, with Jesus transfigured in front of them, the Father says, This is my Son, my beloved Son. Listen to Him. I mean, the voice is talking directly to Peter, James, and John. Listen to Him. Now, why does the voice say that? Why does the Father tell them to listen? Well, again, they are imagining, they are, they are wanting a, a Savior, a Messiah, who kicks butt and takes names. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? They're wanting a Messiah who comes in and destroys their enemies. Who comes in power and glory and clothes them with power and glory. Makes it so that everyone loves them, respects them, fears them. They are wanting, they are imagining, they are hoping for, they are trying to make Jesus into the exact same Messiah that Satan tempted him to be out in the desert. The exact same Messiah that Peter has just tempted him to be. standing there before them transfigured and with the voice of God coming down and saying, this is my son, listen to him. God is basically saying to them, you need to put aside your preconceptions, you need to put aside your biases, you need to put aside your self-interest, you need to put aside who you want Jesus to be and listen to what he's saying about who he really is. See, what's going on there isn't just Jesus being revealed to them as he's always been, right? As in his power and glory as the second person of the Holy Trinity. What's also going on there is that the road ahead is being revealed, right? This, this road ahead that they have just embarked on, this road to Jerusalem, this road to, to rejection, suffering, and death. They're getting just a little glimpse of what's on the other side of that. They're getting just a little glimpse of why it is so important that Jesus maintain himself solidly within the identity as God's beloved son they're getting a little glimpse of why it is so important that he live that perfectly obedient and loving life why he go through the rejection and the suffering and the death they're getting a little picture of the resurrected Jesus they're getting a little picture of the Jesus on the other side of that road to Jerusalem, uh, of a transformed Jesus living a new life and who through His transformation is going to change the very nature of death and life for everyone. They're not just getting a picture of Jesus' past and present. They're getting a picture of Jesus' future, a future lived in new and eternal life in God's very presence. And although they didn't realize it at the time, they're also getting a picture of their future. They're getting a picture of their future. As tempting as it must have been for them, you know, like Peter said, hey, let's just camp out up here. Let's just stay up here on top of the mountain. As, as tempting as it was for them to, to think that, Jesus knew that they had to eventually come down. They had to eventually get back on that road to Jerusalem, that road to rejection, suffering, and death, fear, isolation, and confusion. And while the disciples may well have thought that would be the end of the road, Jesus knew that it was not. In fact, if, if you read through John's Gospel in, in chapters 13 through 16, he, he basically says to him, look, it's a good thing that I leave you. I gotta leave we got to go through this rejection, suffering, and death thing so that I can leave and I can send you the Holy Spirit so that you, as followers, can enjoy that same life. 
Just as Jesus, through His transformation at His resurrection, transformed the nature of death and life, those disciples, through His coming death and resurrection, would have the opportunity to enjoy that same life for themselves, to be transformed into the very image of Christ Himself. Of course, this is a promise that Jesus doesn't just make to those disciples. It's a promise that he makes to us as well. Now, lots of y'all in this room, you've had those mountaintop experiences, right? You've had those times where you're, you're in the flow. You are there with God. You feel that love. You feel that joy and that hope. You just know that God loves you. You know in your deepest being that you are a beloved child of God, and that's all that matters about you. But we all know that we can't stay up there, right? And so we've all come back down into the real world, a world that tells us that we don't have enough, we don't do enough, we aren't enough, a world that worships a Messiah who kicks butt and takes names, a Messiah who's a lot more like Chuck Norris than Jesus Christ. But just as Jesus gave hope to those disciples on the top of that mountain. In this book right here, He gives us hope. He tells us that we are His beloved children. We, like Him, are beloved children of God. And the more we live into that identity, the more like God we become. The Apostle Paul tells us in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 18, he puts it this way. And so we are transfigured. So we are transfigured. Much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and as we become like Him. We are transfigured. Jesus wasn't just showing those disciples his future or their future. He's showing us our future. As we live into our identity as beloved children of God, as we realize that that is who we are and that is all that matters about us, it doesn't matter what, what the world says we ought to do. Jesus is giving us hope and he's saying, look, you don't have to live the way the world wants you to live. You don't have to Accept the identity that the world wants to put on you. You're not defined by what you have, what you do, what people think about you. You are my beloved child. And again, the more we live into that, the more we become transformed into the very image of Christ, into the very image of that man standing up there on top of that mountain. And the more we live into that image, the closer we got to God we get. And the closer to God we get, the more we live into that image. And that's where these buttons come in. We still got some. If you haven't been here, I invite you to pick one of these up on the way out. If you have been here, I inv- invite you to take some more. So I gave away, I think I gave away about six or seven of these this week. And I want some of y'all to beat me on that. I want to give away as many of these as we possibly can. They say, you are a child of God, and I'm going to treat you that way. When you look in the mirror, be reminded that you, too, are a child of God. And when you're out there in the world, doing your banking or your grocery shopping or your coffee drinking or whatever it is, let the folks that you are interacting with know that they also are beloved children of God. Give them that message. What a gift. Same gift that Jesus gave his disciples up on top of that mountain. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty and loving God, you are a loving God. Uh, You loved us into existence, and you continue to love us. You love us so much you sent your son to show us what love looks like. 
and to enable us to live in that love for ourselves. And so this week, help us to do just that. Help us to live in that love and to live out that love to the world around us that so desperately needs some of that love. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.